So uh, my uh, pleasure is to straighten up my thoughts and maybe also yours on the role of nutrition in ERAS surgery. And uh, it certainly is part of this graph here. We can see perioperative nutrition and carbohydrate loading, avoiding fasting before surgery are two items in the ERAS protocol. And if you look at the guidelines, uh, it, it is stated there for colorectal surgery uh, that patients should be screened for nutritional status. If deemed to be at risk for undernutrition, they should be given active nutritional support. And preoperative fasting should be minimized. And patients should be encouraged to take normal food as soon as possible after surgery. And supplements can be used to supplement oral intake. Quite simple. And <clears throat> the issue of prehabilitation, I, I really love that word because it, uh, it gives you the notion that it's about prevention. It's, it's about preventing damage. And it's really important. And of course, optimizing cardiopulmonary function has been uh, routines in most institutions for a very long time. But also other issues, maybe that have getting more light the recent years, like correcting anemia, screening for glucose control, uh, correcting, uh, uh, improving glucose control in diabetes, smoking cessation, alcohol abstinence, improving physical function maybe, and also the issue of, of uh, improving uh, the nutritional state in patients before this elective procedure really important. And it's been known for a very long time. This is probably the first report from 1936 where uh, Hiram Studley showed in patients undergoing surgery for chronic ulcer disease, uh, peptic ulcer disease, that his patients that had more than 20% weight loss before surgery. So he actually measured weight and he asked them about weight loss at that time. They had 10 times higher mortality than the ones with, a, with less weight loss before surgery. And this uh, finding that preoperative weight loss are so related to adverse postoperative outcome has been confirmed in many studies after that. So that is pretty clear. So what about the current practice then? I mean, many surgeons say, I'm a colorectal surgeon. I, my patients don't have malnutrition, and so it's not a big deal. So I think this report from Manchester is uh, quite clear. It shows that in 132 patients that with a resectable colorectal cancer that were screened two to four weeks before surgery, 50% were weight losing, weight losing, and 20% were considered malnourished. malnourished. And this is very similar to what we found in my, we find in my own institution at Ersta. So how about the practice? This, uh, um, there was this study from Swiss and Austria where uh, 173 surgical departments were asked about their nutritional screening. And although 80% of the departments were aware about the benefits from nutritional support in, in, in undernutrient patients, only 20% had a nutritional screening and only 14% used a nutrition score. <clears throat> and the reality, considering that not all departments answered the survey, is probably much worse. So, if you are going to implement a screen, nutritional screening and a nutritional assessment, you need to have a nutritional intervention. Otherwise, it's completely useless, isn't it? And certainly in malignant patients, you don't have so much time. So you have to do something the same day or the day after when they come to the outpatient clinic for scheduling a co an elective colorectal resection for a malignancy. So you'd need to have someone to give them an, uh, the, what they need, oral supplements or whatever. 
There are a number of various uh, uh, screening tools uh, available, but there are only two tools that have been validated in surgical patients, I would say. Uh, first one is the Nutritional Risk Screening 2002, uh, which uh, takes, takes into account the BMI of the patient, easily uh, calculated, recent weight loss, dietary change, change in dietary intake, and the general condition. That is very simple to do. And we also have the Subjective Global Assessment tool, which we use in my institution, which is also quite simple. It involves uh, di uh, dietary history, uh, uh, recent weight loss, GI symptoms, functional status, comorbidity, and some, uh, some <clears throat> findings in your examination on loss of fat, muscle weight, wasting, edema, or as ascites. That doesn't take more than two, one minute to do. Two minutes. And when you have the patients, if you're interested in finding those patients, you should really look. And there might be some, some subtle signs, like in the elderly lady with a loss of thinner muscles, the young boy with a loss of temporal muscles, or, or, or the woman with a tiny back there. So if you don't look for it, you will never find it. And these patients benefit from a nutritional intervention, that's for sure. <clears throat> the human evolution over the last few years have resulted in this magnificent creature over there. Uh, and in morbidly obese patients, it might be difficult to determine if they have a degree of muscle wasting. And this time the iceberg is upside down. And the tip of the iceberg is really the hidden lean body mass in the patients. And this is very tricky, and I don't have a clear answer uh, <coughs> how, to, how to evaluate those patients, which may, although they have a lot of fat, might have a severe degree of, of uh, muscle wasting. So if you <coughs> have a patient that are screened for uh, malnutrition, you could uh, also do some further assessment, not only with the history and physical examination, but you can include anthropometric measures like mid-arm circumference and tri tricep skin fold, which is really easy to do. You could have some functional measures like the grip strength or, or lung capacity with spirometry, which, which is also very easy. Uh, and you can have some more sophisticated measures like the impedance analysis, DEXA uh, scan or indirect cal calorimetry. And you can use um, objective measures like the transport proteins such as albumin, pre-albumin, transferrin and retinol binding protein. <coughs> However, you have to be aware of, of that in, in the post-operative settings, they are indicate the inflammatory response and the surgical stress rather than the nutritional state. So when you evaluate these patients, you should consider if they have this malnutrition due to starvation related to anorexia or reduced GI tolerance due to a stricture perhaps, if, they, if it's related to chronic disease due to inflammation or fistula or, or some acute disease such as infection. And, and you have to relate the degree of uh, malnutrition to the, se severe, the severity of the scheduled surgical insult. If you have a scheduled procedure with a high infection rate and a long uh, hospital stay, this, this is even more important. This is probably the first paper on the SGA screening uh, from the 80s, and you can see here that patients with SGAC has a much higher rate of infections on longer hospital stay. And this is about 20, 25% of the patients that have SGA, B and C. It's, a, it's, it's every four patients that come into the clinic for a colorectal resection. <clears throat> when it comes to parenteral nutrition uh, before surgery, we basically rely on historical data and maybe not so relevant, but this is a very nice uh, systematic review from an expert committee 
by Samuel Klein and Kinney and Gigi Boy. And they found that uh, in 13 studies, there were a 10% reduction in, in, in complications in mostly malnourished patients. One word of caution on the refeeding syndrome, though, because even a severely depleted patient, when they come in and they get uh, feeding and they will have an insulin uh, response, and if they are severely depleted, this might result in severe uh, electrolyte disturbances and volume overload, ATP depletion, uh, which might uh, severely affect uh, organ function and result in, in a fatal outcome. So in, in those patients, you should be careful the first few days and provide only uh, 50 to 70% of their energy, uh, calculated en energy intake, uh, normally required. You should monitor electrolytes and provide vitamins and uh, prokinetics and, and PPI to support the enteral route. <clears throat> this is uh, some results from a quite recent uh, Cochrane re review on preoperative nutrition. And uh, they looked first on immunohancing nutrition before GI surgery, which were which was seven randomized trials. This is, was done in mostly well-nourished patients, and they were given this treatment for five to seven days before surgery. It, it included additional arginine and omega-3, and, and sometimes nucleotides or glutamine. And they could show that they had uh, reduced total complications, reduced infectious complications, and a reduced hospital stay. And this is uh, the, the figures from uh, immunonutrition versus standard or no nutrition. And, and these studies were done in, mostly done in one center in Italy. Uh, and I mean, they, they have fish on the diets every day, isn't it, on the menu? And one thinks about Sweden, where we are raised from birth on a, on a pro-inflammatory diet, how, how the situation would be for us. Probably much better, I don't know, or not. So we need to do more studies in other parts of the world, I guess, to see the effect from this type of intervention. But the data are quite clear. And then there are some, they included, there were only three randomized trials on parenteral nutrition that were deemed, uh, 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 that had enough quality to be included in this review. And they could show a reduction in major complications. But this was done in mostly malnourished patients. And there were <coughs> three oral, three studies on oral intake and two studies on enteral standard nutrition and they could find no um, effect on outcomes. What we really need here is to, to evaluate nutritional interventions in conjunction with the ERAS protocols. This should be done. So the recommendation would be that to screen all patients undergoing major GI surgery, provide supplements if malnourished, and in case of a stricturing process or reduced GI tolerance, provide some nutritional support and consider parenteral nutrition if the situation, situation is really bad. So in summary, for preoperative nutrition, we could say that it is related to adverse outcome. Current practice rarely include nutritional screening or interventions, but we know that it is effective. And all malnourished patients before any procedure should get some intervention. And we should consider this in all patients before major surgery when, you know, with regard to immunonutrition, at least when we look at the available data. Now this uh, iceberg is uh, right again, and, and it's, um, hyperglycemia is really the tip of the iceberg. And below the water level is much going on. And, and it's so much that we don't know about also, but it's, it's really a measure of body catabolism and stress. And it's, <clears throat> it's a result of an increased gluconeogenesis. It's a result of nitrogen and protein losses, muscle wasting, lipolysis. And this will in the end affect organ function and the immune response. And the proof of this iceberg is, is really, 
two apart van der Berger's studies showing that that's this glucose level is really related to mortality in patients undergoing stress. <clears throat> so this postoperative insulin resistance is hard to treat when it's actually developed after surgery and it cannot be fed away, but it's possible to prevent this to a degree by avoiding preoperative fasting or by stress reduction by other means, such as epidural anesthesia or minimally invasive surgery. And avoiding preoperative fasting can be easily done by providing this carbohydrate drink, which is 12.6% 12 and will elevate insulin to a level seen after a normal meal. And when we did the initial studies with this treatment, we usually uh, treated patients with mechanical bowel preparation. And so we included providing 800 milliliters in the evening before to avoid fasting the day, after, day before surgery, as well as 400 milliliters of this drink two hours before the induction of anesthesia. And we could show in a number of uh, randomized CLAMP studies that we could reduce insulin resistance by about 50%. In, a diff in various surgical procedures. And there have been not many randomized trials by now that are put in, putting small pieces of the puzzle together. And we could see that it affects not only glucose uh, homeostasis, it also affects protein metabolism, it affects possibly the immune response and some uh, organ function during cardiac surgery. It enhances recovery of the GI function and it reduces hospital stay, as has been shown in recent meta-analysis. <clears throat> also, in our cohort of almost 1,000 patients undergoing uh, surgery for colorectal cancer, we looked at the compliance to the ERAS protocol to, to evaluate the <clears throat> different ERAS items and their... Uh, and their uh, um, their uh, impact on individual, uh, of the in impact of individual ERAS variables on outcome. And we could find that two items were significantly an independent predictors of the improved outcome, and that was preoperative carbohydrate loading and the perioperative fluid volume. <clears throat> so certainly the, a balanced uh, fluid uh, tr uh, infusion is really important also not to underhydrate or overhydrate the patients. So the recommendation would be to provide this carbohydrate loading two hours before induction of anesthesia. However, however, we have to consider that some patients with a slow gastric emptying need to be excluded from the treatment. <clears throat> so postoperative uh, nutrition. Uh, is also important. And this is a meta-analysis showing, this is in studies mostly with the traditional care. But anyway, they could show that early enteral feeding was safe um, and it was related to a reduction in, in infectious complications. And an updated meta-analysis by the same group, 2009, showed, showed a reduction in mortality by early feeding from 6.9 to 2.4 percent, which is remarkable, I think. You, you have to realize that early feeding may be related to increased incidence of vomiting. So in the, early, in the elderly and very tired and frail patient, you need to be aware of the risk of, of aspiration, I think. And, and if you suspect a, a retention uh, in the stomach, you need, to, you need to do something about that in, in the elderly patient. So, but eating after elective colorectal surgery is not a big problem, actually. This is 143 of our patients undergoing open colorectal surgery. And you can see that from the first day, they eat about, together with the supplements, about 1,500 calories. So it works really very well. This is an old study from Orderhus in Denmark showing that uh, when the patient started eating after surgery, 
they had their supplements, which are the white bars, part of the bars. And you can see that even if they increase their eating, they still take their supplements. So we think, we think that they sort of add on to the, to the number of calories that, that the patients take. So we still recommend supplements, and we, we recommend that you take at least 600 cal calories from supplements <coughs> the day of sur surgery, and nine, more than 900 calories the following days. And if the patients have an inadequate food intake or a preoperative malnutrition, it's probably good if they take supplements even after discharge. Probably. What about reduced GI tolerance? And I recently find, found out, talking to our gastroenterologists, that, there, that there's actually a new uh, prokinetic agent on the market. I was not aware of that. And it, it, it's a highly selective serotonin agonist, procalopril, and it has no effect on, on cardiac to toxicity uh, or any other toxicity. Um, and it's indicated for obstipation in IBS patients, but it might be a very good agent for ERASP. I don't know about that. We have to try it. So what about postoperative parenteral nutrition? And it's well established that in the well-fed patients, you will just get more infections if you, get, if you treat them parenterally. And, but in the patient with, mal with malnutrition, you will have reduction in mortality. So, uh, so we could recommend that in the well-fed patients, you can wait at least five days before you uh, start with the parenteral nutrition, probably longer. It depends on also how long you think they, they can be without food, so to say. If you think it's a prolonged condition, you, you might start at five days, or you might wait a little bit longer. But if, uh, if you have a patient with malnutrition, you should be more active and start after two days or something. So what about uh, how much calories? And, and there are, is this uh, meta-analysis on 12 studies, eight randomized trials, sh sh uh, looking at short-term nutritional support with uh, isocaloric nutrition or underfeeding, so to say, when they provide more than 50 but less than 100% of the energy requirements. And this, this meta-analysis showed actually improved outcomes if you underfed the patients a little bit for a short time. But it's indicative of that you might not be too ambitious with the calories. But the, the poor study design and a lot of heterogeneity uh, makes it very difficult to, to, to interpret these data. But it sort of indicates also that in ERAS patients, if they have a reasonable oral intake of about 1,500 calories, that's pretty good. You don't need to be too, too afraid of that. So now we're back to the <coughs> omega-3 fatty acid, and I think looking at the effects from this, we should probably be mermaids or something. Uh, but you cannot deny that there are, uh, there are some, uh, some convincing data out there. And this is a reason, <coughs> this is a recent um, meta-analysis published this year in clinical nutrition looking on 21 randomized trials giving fish oil-based parenteral nutrition after surgery. And they had a reduction of, of infectious complications and also of length of stay. And, and uh, the total effect was 2.14 days. I mean, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> Quite impressive. Uh, Post-discharge nutrition, I mean, there are really no evidence out there. But it's mo probably also related to the lack of data. And it seems reasonable in to support oral intake with supplements in patients with malnutrition or patients with a low energy intake before discharge. So this is my busy conclusion slide, it's that we should have nutritional screening, we should have nutritional interventions for patients with malnutrition, and we should consider immunoenhancing nutrition for five to seven days before major surgery, if we look at the available data out there. We should pro avoid preoperative fasting, we should, uh, <clears throat> with the use of postoperative multimodal ERAS interventions, 
we will support early oral feeding by enhancing GI recovery. And we should consider supplements, standard supplements or immuno-enhancing nutrition um, in, in these patients. But we really need studies in patients uh, undergoing ERA surgery because this is completely different situations to all the other studies out there performed in traditional care. So there's so much we don't know. But it's more to it than a perfect operation. Thank you.